Well, hello, I'm Dr. Julia Royston and welcome to uh, Live Your Best Life. Always excited to bring you people, places, things, information and tools and, and really opportunities to help you live your best life. There's nothing like living your best life for I come that you might have life and have that life to the full and overflowing and abundantly. And I also want to uh, recognize that I am an international show. So I'm giving a special shout out to the uh, Nigerian station that we're now syndicated on uh, Regia uh, Radio Network. So a uh, welcome to all my Nigerian brothers and sisters. So glad to have you listening to live your best life. So glad that you're here. So I want to introduce my uh, special guest and uh, thrilled to have her on. Uh, first lady, uh, um, teacher, uh, organizer, administrator, uh, Mrs. Virginia Rector. I want her to introduce herself, tell us where she's from, and um, tell us kind of what she's doing right now uh, in her life. Because I know she's been through a little transition, but uh, we're going to be talking about her books later. But I want her to tell us exactly what she's doing right now. Ms. Rector? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Yes, um, I am Virginia Rector, originally from Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I say that with royalty, I say that because that's where my childhood experiences um, were all um, just developed. And then 16 years ago, I relocated to Delaware where the president of the United States home is located um, with my husband who's a pastor. So be careful who you marry because you never know where life may carry you. But um, that, that's how I, I, I came to Delaware. And in, for, in terms of teaching, I really think that as a child, uh, my mother saw that I was going to be some form of a teacher. And I actually was a professor at the University of South Carolina Spartanburg and at Spartanburg Methodist College and at Spartanburg Technical College. So when we transferred to Delaware, I became certified in special education. And most of my work was basically in a support position, but I never was treated totally like support because I knew that the teachers knew there that they had a very special, highly qualified support person. And I always seemed to, to just travel with colleagues um, all the time given special privileges to do whatever I need to do for the student. And that was what was most important to me. That was very rewarding to always have that close relationship with students. And in many cases, sometimes with parents. Um, seeing a child do well, seeing them improve, seeing them work to the very best of their ability, giving them encouragement, allowing them to feed back to you thoughts of care and trust, that was most rewarding for me. Uh, I, can, I can all only imagine um, that I am a retired teacher, you're a retired teacher as such, because you're always going to be teaching. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't really uh, matter about where it is, whether it's teaching in church or teaching in public school or teaching a workshop, you're always going to be a teacher. I think teachers are just always going to teach in some way, shape or form. And they were very fortunate to have you. So, so what was the worst thing about teaching? What's the worst thing about teaching? From the college level to the public school level, and even in the community, because I still work with youth in the community, it's always wondering what more you could have done. Um, at this time in our lives, we're just emptying ourselves, as one young man has said to me, we're pouring out what God has given us, what our parents have instilled in us, what education has instilled in us. And we're trying to convey that, and we're trying to convince younger, a younger generation the things that are important in, in order for them to survive, in order for them to be better, in order for them to be good citizens, to have all the wonderful character education development that they need to go forward in life, all the small things that seems to be overlooked right now. We're trying to 
recreate that for them to help them to understand why they are still necessary. We don't do away with just everything. Saying thank you, saying yes instead of yeah, um, being polite, those are still very, very important courtesies as well. But just always wanting to see better, always wanting to do better. And the worst for me is when I feel like I haven't given all or haven't been able to reach someone or need to do something differently to reach that individual. I think one of the biggest things, the, the problems I really had when I came to, okay, so I spent 10 years in private school where um, the young, a lot of the young women, not all, but a lot of them had, they, they came from privilege. Their parents could pay the 10 or $11,000 a year. Um, you know, whether they scraped it together, they paid it. And then there were some students there on scholarship. And then there were some that they recruited that they knew, you know, couldn't pay at all. So they were trying to uh, expand their horizons, you know, broaden their horizons, et cetera. Then I spent 10 years or 12 years, excuse me, in um, public school. And I had a rude awakening because I have no biological children of my own. And then when I went to school, I had two parents. My dad was a teacher. He did retire from teaching. My mother was home. She was the room mother. She was the vice president of the PTA. The only reason why she wasn't the president is because we had too much church activities. So I think my biggest uh, thing about um, the school setting is I didn't realize that this generation required so much of that because we had to spend so much time getting with the yes and the uh, response and uh, are you hungry? Have you eaten yet? Uh, are you tired? Uh, where is your backpack? I left it at my daddy's house, but my other backpack's at my mama's house and my book and my notebook and my homework is in. There was so, there's so much housekeeping mm -hmm. that has to be done that you know getting to the actual curriculum of what you're actually teaching most people don't even understand that that we have to take so much time to even get there like I can after 12 years in public school I can look at a child getting off the bus because I taught every child and look at them and tell okay it's not gonna be a good day we're gonna have to they're going to need a little extra today. They've already had a bad day and they're just getting off the bus. They're just getting in the building or they're hungry or they're, and that's that same dirty uh, ketchup stain I saw on that shirt on Monday and it's Thursday and they're still, I know it's uniform, but, you, but somebody hasn't taken the care to realize, take that shirt off, it's dirty. You know, you got to get a clean shirt or whatever, whatever. So I think that was for a, uh, a young person, that was like my biggest rude awakening for coming into public school. And then the older teachers, they would tell me, the ones that had been much more experienced than me, they were like, when you're not going to be able to save them all. You're not going to be able to save them all. I mean, there's just some of them you're just not going to be able to save. You're going to do your best and you're going to never feel like you're doing enough. But for a new teacher coming into or somebody who's thinking about teaching. If there's some a young person listening to me, whether you're in the States or around the world, listening to me, what are a few things that you would tell someone who thinks, I think I wanna be a teacher, a new teacher, what would you tell them? I would say to them, please, whatever you do, don't lose that, that drive, that enthusiasm, the creativity that God has poured into you um, the act of innovation. Don't lose any of those things. Don't be discouraged when it doesn't go exactly the way and it will not go exactly the way you have learned it from a book. Uh, even with your practical experiences that we had back in South Carolina, even with um, your student teaching experiences, you could kind of do those things for so many weeks and then leave them and, and step back and maybe uh, ponder a little bit time is going to go a lot swifter when you actually get a teaching position. And as you mentioned, all the paperwork, all the rigor, watching how monies, the limited budgets that are given to schools, how those monies are filtered into certain areas, and perhaps you don't agree with where the money is going. You're going to have to work beyond that. You're going to have to pull out those creative juices, and you're going to have to make 
sometimes make lemonade out of lemons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So just just being holding on to that creativity, holding on to that that gift, that talent of teaching it's in itself. Um, one time uh, I was working with a teacher and all of a sudden all the um, the power went out. Mm -hmm. And so everything was on the smart board and everything was on this piece of electronic equipment and, and on and on and on. And, and she just fell flat. And she was like, what in the world am I going to do? Because I had everything planned out and everything was going to be just perfectly orchestrated through technology. And all the technology had gone dry because there was no power. And I whispered to her because the kids were looking like little DDs. They were like, okay, feed us, feed us. I mean, you better get our attention now because it's not going to be here very long. What oh, are you going to yeah, do today? Yeah. You know, <laughs> if you don't play Ooh. something, we're going to play something for I know you. That's okay. Right. We're going to take not over this place. Be in the place. curriculum. <laughs> that's right. And it might not be pretty. That's there you go. So um, I kind of walked up to her and kind of whispered to her, um, do what you were trained to do. And she looked at me. <laughs> She gave me this really strange look like, what are you saying? I said, do what you were trained to do. And she said, what are you saying? I said, teach, teach them. And this teacher tickled me because she was a little more seasoned as well. And she sat on her desk and she crossed her leg and she began to teach. And I said, hallelujah, that's mm -hmm. all that's required. That's all these children want is for you just to teach them, mm -hmm. feed them. You have enough knowledge within now that you don't have to depend on what you have through technology. Mm. So that would be my my biggest um, piece of, of advice to a young teacher coming in. Do what teach, you teach, teach, just teacher. teach, just teach, 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 teach. absolutely. You absolutely. know, it's amazing that uh, you would say about technology because I was a technology teacher. So mm -hmm. therefore, I always had to have as they say, a bag or a box of tricks or something in, in my, uh, you know, and, and we, I was in technology, so I didn't really need a lot of stuff, you know, paper and pencil. We didn't need that. But you best believe I had a box of papers. I had a box of pencils. I had a box of crayons. I had all of that backup plan. I had uh, flashcards for math and flashcards for vocabulary for the little ones, just in case something happened and everything was shut down, I was still good to go. Or I always made sure my iPads were charged, my Chromebooks were charged, because just in case something happened, we'd be rotating centers. And I created centers like, okay, four y'all over there, five y'all go back there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be able to teach. And I had 45 minutes, or I had 55 mm -hmm. minutes one year. And so therefore that, that teaching teacher, and that's for any uh, industry across the board. You got to be able to do what you got to be able to do. And you, <laughs> and you got to be able to make it make sense. And uh, my principal came in one time. He said, what's going on? Oh, uh, Ms. Ross said, what are you going to do? I said, you see them, don't you? <laughs> As they say, they all working, right? And he said, uh, yeah, you did a great job. I, I said, well, you know, I had to come up with a, a backup plan, a, another plan or, or what. And I feel like that that's that's been one of the keys even throughout this pandemic, like how are we going to continue to move ministry forward? How are we going to, you know, with the church ministry, how is that going to look now? How is the classroom going to look now? How is your house going to look now? Um, being in a pandemic, what does that look like? And what should that be like for you? So it's time to continue to move forward, teach teacher, preach preacher, and mother, mother, <laughs> father, father. That's right. That's Whatever right. you do it, you better keep it moving. Keep it moving. We'll be right back after this. And we're back. I'm so pleased and honored to have with me uh, Ms. Virginia Rector. And yes, she is an author. Hand, hint. Uh, little did you know, uh, and those of you who are joining me for, for the first time, I am a publisher. I am a writer myself. And I'm always pleased to have other writers and other published authors uh, with us. And Ms. Virginia Rector is one. So uh, Ms. Rector, tell us exactly, uh, tell us about your books, both of them. The first book, and I, I certainly give Julia Royston, BK Publishing, the credit for getting me started, for mentoring me, for coaching me, to using a little phrase, okay, let's go. <laughs> uh, and then that other little famous phrase you will have 
three free classes. You have five three free classes just to <laughs> come and be trained. And, uh, free, free, free. And so that was that was very those that was like music to my ears at the time. And I didn't know that was really a carrot that was being dangled to say you're going to get hooked because this is a lifelong dream that you have wanted to publish a book and to you've got some things to say. So the first book, How Can I Serve You, was all about um, my journey and trying to help other young people to connect to some of the things I did, which was a little outdated for them, but in terms of those special attributes that they would need to be an effective youth leader. So youth leadership, we need to each one reach one, um, understand that my time is not where I once was. I can be more in a consulting role that young people want to see other young people. Uh, they look at me and they think I've never been young before. So uh, now I have that uh, granny persona, that auntie persona. Um, so they want to see someone else in terms of role modeling. Uh, they may pretend that they're not interested in structure, but they just all do embrace the right kind of structure when it's approached in the right way. And so we need to train other younger leaders. So that's what that book was all about. Forget about yourself, concentrate on him and worship him. I think that's a song that has those lyrics to it. It does, it does. And uh, that's what we wanted them to, to, to kind of lean on and think about. And the fruit of the spirit, which is all throughout the book. Those are some of the great attributes that need to be um, adapted to, adopted within our lives, poured into our spirit as we move forward. And we understand that leadership is not all about us. And in the words of my dear husband, he says that ministry and leadership is not always convenient. So just planting those seeds and giving a little nugget here and there, How Can I Serve You was the first book. And I thank you, uh, BK Royston Publishing Company for placing me on that particular journey, not knowing I thought I'd be done and not have to write any more after that. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Before you move on to uh, book number two, so those of us who are older, how do you think is the best way to, uh, and, and uh, how can I serve you is uh, a great tool and a great resource. Be sure and find it. Uh, on Amazon and find uh, Ms. Virginia Rector on, and, and Virginia is just like the, the state in the U.S. And then Rector is R-E-C-T-O-R and find her on um, Facebook as well. But what do you think are some good methods, what we should be uh, doing um, to be able to uh, prepare the next generation? I mean, you know, when, when do you feel like a leader? Well, first off, my first question is, when do you think a leader should be looking for a successor or realizing? Because I think sometimes um, some leaders hold on to things so long until the things did, nobody wants to come, nobody wants to be a part. And then they start trying to find a, a successor. So when is the best time that leaders really need to be finding uh, a successor or somebody or a youth leader to work with it? When you start or after you've been in, and doing it for a while, how do you think that looks? In, in my opinion, it is when your fellowship uh, as a leader start to tell you or give you some hints that we want to, to take a little bit more leadership role ourselves or um, how can we become involved? And so you need to listen more than just with your head. You need to listen with your heart and they're sharing with you, we're not trying to usurp necessarily all of your authority or whatever you're doing uh, in terms of leadership, but we want to connect more. We want to learn more. Give me an assignment. Let me reach out. Let me do some things. Mm -hmm. And that way, you know that you can, with comfort, say, at least I'm training. At least I'm developing. I'm getting somebody else ready and prepared to do because the way life is right now, we may not be able to see tomorrow mm -hmm. and we need to have some other troopers and some other people in position to take our place. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, in my opinion, because it's being more revealed to us now more than ever, ever, ever before 
that that's where we should be uh, at a certain time of our lives. And I don't think it always necessary to have a, an age to it. Uh, Joyce Myers has come out with a new book about something about growing old and not feeling old or something like that. And, right. and Joyce is doing her thing. I mean, yeah, I, she I, is. I, I really admire that about her. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, she knows she knows that there there is always a handwriting on the wall. Right. And so we must must be sensible about that. And we must be intentional and in, in preparing other people and understand our purpose and understanding that some of these things that we've learned don't necessarily come overnight, but they come with practice. They have to be experiential and uh, we have to convince and influence and train and, and teach how to be a trustworthy person, mm -hmm. what the signs of, are of being a good mentor, uh, how do you build relationships? And you start with Jesus Christ and you tell them for certain that Jesus Christ himself was a very relational person. Very. So when you give those teachings and those types of nuggets, then there's something uh, that will be that they will catch on to, and you know you're being effective when certainly when they learn to ask questions. Yeah, don't yeah. ever think the questions are dumb. All questions are just good questions because mm -hmm. that's when the the real learning takes place when they're learning to ask the question. Yeah, and then your teaching takes place too as well. And you know, you know, you think well, they're learning naturally by watching me. No, you have to have practice. You know, absolutely. Just like we talked about earlier with. Um, what you learned in the classroom, you don't know nothing. Uh, you 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 pass the test, you turned in the paper, yay, that's so good. You got the diploma, boo boo. The real learning comes when you see that twenty four pair of eyes, or you see those. If you have a youth group and those ten or fifteen pairs of eyes are looking back at you to lead them, and then so sometimes, just like you do in elementary school, you always pick the line leader and sometimes Absolutely. the line leaders just they shine and sometimes the line leaders are like i didn't know which way to go this person i i don't think you know aren't you leading the line well lead the line let's go you know where we go and have and you know and they're like it was harder than i thought mm -hmm. that's right that's why we have others do it because it looks easy when somebody else does it but it's not necessarily as easy as it looks oh. That, and that's the joy that's the joy is making it look easy yeah. you know <laughs> but you're absolutely right you're absolutely right and also recognizing that in this age and time there are things that they know that we may not know as well as they yes. know and technology will be one of in my case so sometimes you can learn from each other and yes. i think they they really feel empowered when they can give back and share of some of the knowledge that they have as well. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's really key and, and critical is being able to learn from each other because um, I have been younger once, you know, I'm running to an, uh, I'm, as they say, I'm moving fast to a, a next major milestone in, in my life and a, another, and so I'm looking at that. I'm trying to figure out cruise control and what that looks like. And but that learning from each other is, you know, really, really key. And I strive every day to make sure because there's a lot I can do. There's a lot I know, but there's some other things. Miss Julia, have you ever thought about doing uh, doing it this way, Miss Julia? And I, you know, I have younger people working with me, younger brains around me, and I want to always keep that. Be and I also want to, the biggest thing, I want to keep myself in check because I could have great help around me and mm -hmm. turn that great help off That's by right. just so busy trying to make sure I'm in charge and everything. So fortunately, you know, I, I, I work on myself and say, okay, um, they do have a better way. They do mm -hmm. know how to do it. Uh, a different way that you might not have thought about before, but ooh, that's going to be so much more help if you let them do it because they got younger minds, younger bodies, younger everything. And so you think, yes, thank you, God. You know, instead of being, no, I'm the head, I'm in charge, you no, that's that's not the right attitude because they all figure out something else to do. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And they're, and they're pulling, they're people pulling at them all the time mm -hmm. for their talents and their skills. So we need to find better ways. And also, and I think that's excellent about self-evaluation. That's so very, very important that we need to reevaluate ourselves and, and look at the fact that we're, we're basically human too. Um, mm -hmm. We do know a lot, we can do a lot, 
but it also keeps us from totally burning out. Yeah. We can work together. Collaboration is powerful. Yes, That's a it powerful is. tool. Yes, it so if it's used correctly and everybody understand there may be some little boundaries here or boundaries there. Um that's respect yeah and you, you do yeah. in respect and i think everybody kind of grows from that i think that's the trick of the enemy to keep us from collaborating and partnering you know keep us from always saying well who's going to get the credit and who's really in charge and who name who name goes on and you know that in church <laughs> whose name gonna go in the program first and whose name and oh you left my name off and, oh you spilled it off it left the e off you left the s off and i'm like oh did the uh -huh. job get done did god get glory did you know, did we help somebody? Did the little baby get the scholarship? All right, good. I mean, that that's the ultimate goal. But it's the enemy's job to keep us in our feelings so we don't realize the big picture. We don't realize the larger picture and all that. Good stuff. Well, you know, we can talk for hours. So let's go ahead with your uh, second book. <laughs> the second book, um, again, when you look back at your life and you look at how it all starts to come together, uh, there is still that little component of being that little girl or that little boy, perhaps that you were, you once were, and you start to think about now who else can relate to what we're trying to do here. And so with the coloring book, um, with one of the um, schools that I was assigned to, it was an alternative school. And what we would do for the, the young people, sometimes the first part of the day was to allow them to, uh, it's particularly like you mentioned, when they were kind of riled up or uh, just couldn't settle down, we would bring out these uh, mandalas. And they were uh, just an abstract piece of art, just uh, all over the place, sometimes like it was not anything that you could relate to and, until you started putting color to it. And they would just take color pencils or crayons and start putting color to it. Sometimes there would be actually a design that was embedded in the mandala. Sometimes it was just a beautiful array of colors. But they seem to be, become centered and settled down just from the coloring. So with the color book, coloring book, we still began with, um, with some leadership pieces in it because it was like a year and a half or close to two years before it was actually published. But I began the book with a pastor from the Virginia area who was a former art teacher. And uh, we talked and we just kind of clicked and we began to work on the project together. Again, it was about leadership and helping younger people to understand that you have a divine power to go to. Um, nowadays, we do take it more seriously when a child says I'm stressed or I, I'm feeling some form of anxiety. Um, we wanted to find, we wanted them to be able to tap into a source. And so we started talking about how can we tell them a little bit about Jesus Christ and not make them feel like we're just bombarding them or hitting them over the head with a uh, scripture. And so we started that particular project and then the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic happened, a lot more was revealed to us in terms of how children were really suffering. Uh, socialization, as you mentioned, was a big piece because they really depended on going to school and interacting with friends. They could no longer do that. Then this social distancing piece came up about, and then the the mask and the the hand sanitizing, which we should have been doing all along. But yeah. again, these things were just kind of forced upon us and forced upon the adolescents, and they did not totally understand all of what was happening. You go from sneezing inside the arm. Um, the elbow part of the arm to all of a sudden covering your entire your, your nose and your mouth and and everything and that was just very different for them so we wanted to find a way to release some of that anxiety we wanted to do a little bit of goal setting uh we knew that they were a collective audience at that time because they were not traveling and going out as much as they were going out and we wanted to, them to be able to internalize some of their activities or things that they could do and think more critically. So it had to be um, something that they could come up with in terms of their own imagination and creativity. What can we do that would not cause bodily harm that would be healthy and safe for us to do during this season of isolation or pandemic? And that's how this was birthed. And we actually saw one child 
being a little distraught, drawing a picture of the coronavirus in her driveway. And that was our aha moment. Okay, that'll be the first child we need to contact just to see if she will be interested in providing some drawings for other children and for herself. Um, would she like to be uh, published in her first little book? Mm -hmm. And so we did compile the drawings. We found about three young students, one college student that participated. And it was very exciting to work with them. And there is a message. There's some subliminal messages in the book. There's some thoughts about being becoming a critical thinker, setting goals, uh, developing a relationship with Christ. There are scriptures that they can always, through activity, they can always go back and read. Um, so a lot came out of the book. And then now um, I noticed that some people are requesting what more can be done with the book. If there are small churches that don't have a large budget, they can think in terms of with their after school program, this could be a piece that they could use to teach from. Most definitely. And in the future, um, one of the things moving forward, I think I'm going to create a few lessons, mm -hmm. maybe to go into a special edition of the book, mm -hmm. because there are lessons that can be taught from the pictures that are in the book. And so there's a lot that comes out of it. Uh, each one of the young people that participated did a profile of themselves. And it's just very, very interesting to hear their stories as well. So that's what, um, how can I serve you for tweens and teens came about. Initially, it was going to be a teen oriented book. And then we found that we had a younger person than a teenager. She wasn't a teenager quite yet. She <laughs> wanted to do some drawings and how could we say no? Because we saw she was right there yeah. with the, the skill level and the vocabulary. Yes. Um, and then we also were surprised to find that there were some adults that still like to color. Yes. So we have had across the board various generations of people who have enjoyed the book. Yeah. Well, that is a one of the things, even in publishing, that's one of the um new genres that has really taken off, and that's adult coloring. They do that for uh, senior citizens and uh, nursing homes and things of that nature. It helps keep their mind occupied and then their creative juices flowing and they don't become so stationary in the wheelchair. They still keep their arms and their, you know, um, mind moving. And so, yeah, the, the, the coloring book and that adult coloring books have have taken off even more than the, even the child coloring books and uh, just because the age group of 40 and up remember coloring so we still do it in in kindergarten and the little ones but um, that is just really so both of those um, um, books are really really key and I I don't have a um, drawing body i mean bone in my body I, I i do a lot of the other creative arts singing and writing and all that but drawing i just have a great appreciation and a great love for it all but being able to do it no not at all and even the youngest uh uh artist i was like wow they're so good oh my goodness so i appreciate art i really do i love it all but being able to do it myself is just is just terrible. It's terrible. I'm terrible at it. I can't. Uh, I had a horrible time when I had to take art in seventh grade in middle school. It was awful. I was like, I can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. No, I can't. You know. <laughs> but uh, we keep moving. But it's a beautiful opportunity. It's a great teaching opportunity, and uh, it's just wonderful. So tell me, what's next? What's next for you? Well, as I, I mentioned, um, with, with that particular book, with a coloring book, it would probably be maybe some lessons that will go into a special edition. And I do appreciate your patience with all of me and all <laughs> the, <laughs> all the uh, scheduling. <laughs> well, believe you get... me, you're not sitting home just twiddling your thumbs. It's not, it's not like oh, no. you don't have a whole world going on going on in the middle of a global pandemic in the middle of recovering from a global pandemic i mean there's a lot going on in your world <laughs> absolutely absolutely and being and being more involved in the community with uh the vaccines and and with trying to keep some uh keep the children connected the youth uh keeping them engaged uh we're just finding different ways to do that and being more creative as you mentioned 
uh, we have to be transformational right now. We, we yeah. can't just be, we're still uh, agents of change, but we have to be transformational. And then with being that, we have to be open-minded. We have to listen with our hearts. We have to listen with our ears. Um, we have to understand that we're dealing with a smart little generation. Yeah. And uh, if we don't allow their talents and skills to be utilized um, in a good setting, then the world has so much more to pull after them um, to do. I'm looking at maybe um, I've had to do a little bit. I was so happy and thrilled to hear about your Nigerian connection. Yay! Because... Yay. Out of all that I'm doing, I'm, I'm taking an innovation class that demanded that I get involved with some things globally. So I've connected to someone in Japan who okay. uh, is also talking about maybe with her students, allowing them to draw some pictures as well. Oh, and then wow. having a comparison of what we're doing in here in the United States. So we'll just oh see how that all develops. It, it could turn into something totally it different. Sure could. But we could do uh, hands across the world. We never know. So never know. If the Nigerian uh, brothers and sisters want to join us and you draw, let me know. Reach oh, out to I me. will. Find me on Facebook. Find us on uh, Facebook reach out to me via my website and you can find me julia.royston.net or find me on facebook linkedin instagram twitter i'm everywhere you want to be just google my name and uh and send us something because we would love to uh highlight younger people i just think that's just so incredible i want to always introduce i have writing classes for um that i'm doing with two schools to publish their books on uh uh, one is Game Changers and one is Trailblazers. So we're wonderful. Yeah. So working with young people. So that's the reason why I'm retired so I can do more. And I know that's why you're retired, uh, Sister Rector, because there's one thing about being in a, uh, a really almost too structured setting. Mm -hmm. You can't really do safely and freely all the things that you want to do. You know what I Absolutely. mean? You can't, you know, Absolutely. because you got time and you got lesson plans and you got you know, and we've got to do this this day, and we got the assembly this time, and we got no, and after school stuff, we got to do, mm -mm, it's just professional development. Professional, oh, <laughs> please, that's the, that PD word, okay. So those of you who don't know about professional development, all teachers must be developed and be in classes and workshops every year. It is required to maintain your teaching license and certification. So just because you see a teacher, you know, they say, oh, you have your summers off. Nah. <laughs> We're always learning and, and learning something new. And the laws change, the system change, the curriculum changes, the re curriculum requirements change. And so sometimes we have to totally be changing what we do. So I think change has been the name of the game, especially over the past year or two the the amount of change that we have to go through so ah uh, so thank you sister director it's always a privilege and a pleasure having you on and talking to you whenever whether we're doing books or we're not um because you do uh you and past director do stay on the cutting edge of what's going on despite you know how you feel like i'm getting older i don't know this technology you still are finding ways to uh, to be open-minded enough to make those connections. And we appreciate that. It's great to have leaders who, um, you know, if it's something that you're not familiar with, um, that's okay. As long as you remain open to learning something new and asking the questions, because we need your, um, we need your wisdom. You know, I, as I get older, I realize, you know, I sometimes I need, yeah, I need the young knowledge, but I need the older wisdom. You got to be able to be wise on how you move, when you move, how, how you do it, when you do whatever you're going to accomplish and do. So we appreciate you. Thank you so much. And we appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> Amazon.com is where I can be. My, my products can be found. Yes. And, all, and also, again, to small churches or to anyone who has the after school program, a summer camp. If you are interested in the coloring book, you can order through me or, of course, you can order through um, Amazon. So um, it is available and we would love to serve you. Most definitely, most definitely. Be sure and uh, reach out to and follow 
uh, Ms. Virginia Rector uh, on social media. And of course, because we have the beauty of Zoom, um, she can actually help you and assist you once you get the materials uh, in any way possible. You know, it's she doesn't necessarily have to get on a, these days, we don't have to necessarily get on a plane. Uh, maybe, you know, a little bit in the future we will, but right now we can jump on Zoom and we can be in your classroom and we can communicate with you uh, via Zoom and make that happen. So thank you so much, Ms. Rector. And uh, everybody be on the, the lookout for anything new up and coming that Ms. Rector has out and available, amazon.com for her books. And uh, reach out to us and our prayer today, tomorrow and always is that you live your best life. Be blessed. Have an awesome day.